Hello everybody and welcome back to the second shelf and to another Sunday Recent Reads video. I don't know whether any of you out there watch the Soccer World Championship, um, but I don't think I will have any German viewers uh, today because they, they have to, you know, sort of come back from this uh, from this game yesterday. <laughs> anyway, let's let's talk about books, okay? And the first book I want to talk about is the book that I went out to buy, you remember from my last video, The Carton of Milk, and then I had to order it, and that is Hertha Müller, uh, The Fox Was Ever the Hunter. This is the, the German title, Der Fuchs war damals schon der Jäger, published in 1992. Now, I've talked already a little bit about Hertha Müller, but for those of you who didn't watch um, the last video, um, Hertha Müller writes in German, so this is not a translation, although she is Romanian, but she is part of a German-speaking enclave in Romania, so she always wrote in, um, in, in German. And as you can see from this very obnoxious sticker that I can't remove, because this is a copy from a library sale, which has been... Uh, you know, with, with plastic, so the sticker is underneath the plastic. Anyway, but from this very obnoxious um, sticker, you can see that she won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 2009. Um, I already told you I read this book for uh, a Goodreads book club, Read Around the World book club, where we read um, uh, a book by a female author from a different country each month. And in uh, this month, we, we in June, we travel to Romania, obviously. Now, Hedda Müller and I, we, we have a complicated relationship, and I will tell you about why and what in a minute. But first, let me tell you what the book is about. The book is set in the last days, quote-unquote, of the Ceausescu regime in Romania, so in the late 1980s. And we follow mainly two women, uh, Adina, who is a young school teacher, and her best friend Clara, who works in a factory. Um, Adina is in a relationship with Paul. He's a musician, um, and he and Adina have a group of friends, critical of the regime, you know. And then Clara meets um, a man she falls in love with and starts a relationship with. Uh, his name is Pavel. Um, but it turns out that Pavel is um, a member of the secret police and he informs on Clara's friend Adina and Paul and the group of musicians. Um, so the friendship suffers because of that, because uh, Adina learns that Pavel is part of the secret police. Um, and then, yeah, we follow, follow the journey until the fall of the regime. What I told you is a straightforward plot, but this book is not a straightforward novel in the sense that it tells you a linear story. Um, uh, Hertha Müller's style is quite choppy. Um, she writes, if I can tell you, it's like um, short, relatively short paragraphs um, where she, you know, um, tells me that Pavel binds his uh, sh shoelaces and then they look at a flower. Um, so it's very uh, poetic. Uh, the language is really beautiful and enjoyable. Uh, but for me, and that's why the complicated relationship, it's difficult to get a grip on the plot. And I'm, as you might know, if you're following my channel for any length of time, I'm, I'm really a plot-oriented reader. Um, it's certainly worthwhile. If you are into that kind of style, you should probably just, you know, download a sample uh, on, on Amazon and see whether you like the style. You will, you will immediately know it uh, after you read two or three or four pages. So if you're into that style, into that um, novel telling that is a storytelling that is almost like a 200 page poem and there is no straightforward plot in the sense I mean there is a plot but it's not told in any straightforward sense then this book might definitely be for you and you should check it out because she won the Nobel Prize so can't hurt but for me I can enjoy the language and I can see how masterful Hertha Müller is with on a sentence-to-sentence -sentence level with pictures and metaphors and images, but I don't enjoy the storytelling. So it's not quite my kind of book. The second book um, of this recent reads I want to talk to you about is a memoir, a recent release, um, just in this month, in, in June, and that is Poroshista Kakur's Sick. 
Um, Polshisa Kakpur was born in Tehran um, in 1978, and she and her parents and her younger brother fled the country um, uh, during the Islamic Revolution, and she has been living in the United States ever since. She grew up in Los Angeles, where her, pa uh, her parents lived after um, she, they had to flee the country, and later she moved to Santa Fe and New York. New York is sort of her nirvana. Um, the, the memoir is about, uh, oh, I should tell you also, even though I haven't read it, that uh, Kakpur had published two previous novels, uh, Sons and Other Flammable Objects and The Last Illusion. But like I said, I haven't read it, so I can't talk about that. Now, the memoir tells us about um, uh, Porshisa Kakpur's chronic illness. She has Lyme disease, you know, the disease you can get if you are bitten by a tick. And there's... It's like um, a little bit like malaria, uh, but there is no cure. You have these relapses with fevers and you get dizzy and you have hallucinations and you can be really sick. Uh, it's treatable in the sense that it's manageable, but it's not curable. Um, and a very good friend of mine has chronic Lyme disease. So I was, I, I lo love reading memoirs anyway, but because of the subject, I was really drawn to it. But I have to say, I didn't like the book at all. Um, my first problem was structural. Um, the, the, the story, the memoir, covers uh, Paul Shista Kakpur's whole life, basically from um, the, the, the time that she moved to Los Angeles uh, until two, uh, 2017. And it's told in a back and forth and back and forth. So it's, it was hard for me to get a grip on the journey, you know, and in in a sense, it's very repetitive uh, because she, you know, she feels sick, then she gets addic addicted to drugs, then she goes to another doctor, she feels better, then she feels sick again, then she is, you know, drinking too much alcohol, she gets sick again. So it's in that sense, quite repetitive. And I, I had a difficult time figuring out where we are in in her life in the journey, but that might be my problem. Um, the other thing is that I had a really hard time feeling any empathy at all uh, with the, the storyteller, so with Kakpur herself. Now I know, of course, that you don't have to like the person who tells you a memoir. I've read plenty of memoirs of people with whom I didn't want to have a coffee with. So it's not that I have to, you know, feel friendly or or uh, that I really have to like the person who is telling me the memoir. But this memoir really irked me in a lot of ways. Um, I thought, for me at least, it came across for me uh, as a very arrogant um, way of dealing with life. Uh, it started quite early in the book when she is in Los Angeles and uh, her parents were quite well to do when they were in Tehran, and of course, uh, uh, it, it was difficult for them when they had to uh, flee the country and move to the U.S. So, she, for instance, she tells me that it was really horrible. They had um, this new apartment, and they had to share a bathroom. They only had one bathroom they had to share with the whole family. And I was like, yeah, you know, it's like parents and two children, so what's wrong with one bathroom? Or when she moves to New York... Um, she constantly reminds me how little money she has uh, because she can't, you know, as a writer, she has difficulty m making ends meet. And then uh, she get, goes into detail that she has $1,300 a month, $800 for rent, and then she has to live on only $500 a month. And I, it's like, yeah, and people on welfare? I mean, that's a lot of money, $500 to spend. So all these kind of things piled up, but also the way she approached her illness and her doctors, it, it was not reflective, it was always accusatory. Uh, and I can understand that it was a difficult journey. I know from, like I said, the friend of mine, how difficult it is. Uh, Lyme disease is hard to diagnose. You're sent from you know, one doctor to the next. But the way uh, Porshista Kakpur portrayed it was... Yeah, I, I think maybe she should have waited and until she could really take a step back and look at herself 
um, and tell me a story that was more engaging. But I know a lot of people love this book, so it, it's probably very subjective that I didn't like it at all. And if you are interested in th this kind of memoir, you should check it out. And if you read her novels and love her style, you might even love this one. But for me, it was just not a good book. We stay with nonfiction, um, and the next book I read um, was actually a reread uh, for me, and that is Jampa Lahiri's um, essay collection, In Other Words, translated by Anne Goldstein. I will tell you about the translation in a minute. Um, now, uh, Jampa Lahiri, I, I didn't think she needed any introduction, but when I went to the Waterstones bookstore in Amsterdam to rebuy this book, because I gave it to a friend two years ago and I wanted to reread it, um, and I said, do you have Jampa Lahiri's in other words? And then the bookseller, she asked me, how do you spell his last name? So maybe Jampa Lahiri needs an introduction. She was born in 1967 in London, but she moved uh, with her parents uh, to the US when she was two, and she has lived in the US ever since, so she's considered an American author. Now, her parents were Bengali immigrants, um, uh, and th this book is written was written uh, by Lahiri when she spent um, uh, two years in Rome. She immigrated to Rome. She had a fascination, a fascination with the Italian language from very early on. She learned Italian and she wanted to live there. And I said, translated by Anne Goldstein, she wrote this book in Italian. And that's why it was translated into English by Anne Goldstein. Now, I'm, the book is, by, by the way, bilingual, so you have the Italian and uh, original and the English translation. Um, I, I wanted to reread this book because I had a discussion uh, with, a, with a friend about feeling at home in your language. You know, I'm, I'm born in Germany, I've lived in Holland for 20 years, I've worked in Dutch, uh, then I've written my first novel in German. I wrote crime fiction in English, and now I'm writing another novel in English. So the, the question, what language do you use and what does language mean to you, is for me a very personally interesting subject. Um, and uh, Lahiri, in this uh, collection, she talks about you know, her, um, her use of Bengali, which was the language of her parents and which she spoke exclusively, even though living in English-speaking countries, until she went to school. Um, and then English became her second first language. She wrote in English, you know, her first, uh, her debut, Interpreters of Maladies, which won the Pulitzer Prize in 2000, was written in English, so she never wrote in Bengali. But she didn't feel at home in both languages, and Italian was a sort of a free space language, a language that had no emotional... I mean, she loved it, so it has an, had an emotional um, aspect, but it was not a language filled with expectations from parents or society or whatever. So I, I as you can see from all <laughs> the stickers, I, I find this book endlessly fascinating. Uh, and if you are interested in, in this particular topic of language and, and feeling at home, um, then I can certainly highly recommend this book. We stay with the topic of immigration, sort of, but we return to fiction writing. And the last book I want to talk to you about is Sana Krasikov's The Patriots, published in 2015 or 16. I should have checked that. I'm sorry. Anyway, Sana Krasikov um, uh, lives now in, in the US, but she was born in the Ukraine, and she spent uh, most of her uh, youth growing up in uh, one of the then Soviet republics, uh, Georgia. She writes in English. Uh, so this is not a translated work. Um, again, like with uh, uh, Jampa Lahiri, what language do you write in? But I'm digressing. Um, the book is a multi-generational tale um, starting in the 1930s in Brooklyn. And we follow Florence, um, uh, who is 18-ish at the time. She goes to college there, depression years. It's all very grim. Um, and she decides to immigrate to Russia. First of all, because she met a Russian man in the US and she follows him. That relationship doesn't work out. But she stays in Russia nevertheless, meets another man, also an immigrant from the US, um, 
and they marry and they have a child, Julian. And then later in the novel, uh, um, Julian and the mother Florence go back to the United States in the 1980s. So we follow also Julian's story. Um, and then the uh, Julian's son, Lenny, who in this millennium goes back to Russia um, to make money. So it's, like I said, a multi-generational uh, tale, but it focuses mainly, uh, certainly in the first part, on Florence, on her life as an immigrant in Russia. It gives a really very good, very detailed feel for what it must have been like during that time, before the war and then during the Cold War time in Russia. Uh, she ha didn't have a, a perfect life there by no means, so it's not romanticizing. On the contrary, she spent um, multiple years in a labor camp. She had to leave her son alone, so her son grew up uh, partly in an orphanage. Um, and there is obviously a, quite some research uh, that went into the book, and you can feel that, but in a good way. So it's not info dumping at all. It's really... The, the research has been worked into the story, but because you have this, this trust in this author the, that she has the confidence and she knows what she's talking about, um, so the book feels like a really dense, rich bush, like a, you know, a, a, a thick soup. Not this watery soup where you have to look for the details and then maybe you find a piece of chicken. No, it's really thick and dense. Um, it's told wonderfully from various perspectives, like I said, Florence and Julian mainly. Um, and it gives you the not only the perspective of Florence during her life in Russia, but also what it means for her son Julian to return to the US, how he felt strange there. Um, and what drove his son, Lenny, to go back to Russia, as it were, back, he hadn't been there before, but to go um, uh, to Russia, uh, you know, to, to, for business, to make money there. So if you're interested in these kind of um, uh, decade-spanning, multi-generational tale with quite an unusual setting, I can highly recommend this book. Uh, I also recommended this book for those of you who might participate in the Reading Women Challenge because one of the challenges is read a book set in Russia or by a Russian author, so this certainly qualifies. But there's also another read-along um, almost upon us, uh, and that's Tom Topple. You will all heard about it, uh, organized every year a couple of times uh, by Sam from Thoughts on Tomes. I will leave her announcement video down below. And uh, it starts on the 29th of June and goes until the 12th of July. And one of the things is that you have to read books um, over 500 pages. And this certainly qualifies. So if you're looking for a book because you're participating in Tom Topple, then I can also recommend this one. It's a fantastic tale. It's really well written. And I'm sure you will enjoy it. So this was it for my recent reads on this Sunday. Um, gone long on long enough, this video. Thank you very much for watching if you made it to the end. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. I'm looking forward to talking to you in the comments, as always, about the books I talked about or about other books. Uh, let me know whether you read any of them, and I will see you all soon in my next video. Bye-bye.